In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up a template for creating beautiful mandala designs using Adobe Illustrator. I'm also going to show you how to design those mandalas so that they can be used as part of a coloring book that you can sell on Amazon. Hey guys, Craig here. Hope everybody's doing well. Now, for those of you who are new to my channel, my name is Craig Babin, and I'm on a mission to turn my part-time drawing hobby into a full-time income. And I'm hoping to inspire as many of you as possible to do the exact same thing. So if you have a part-time hobby that you want to monetize, then hit that subscribe button because I'm going to be posting some really useful stuff on this channel that you are not going to want to miss. Okay, so I've had a few requests from my subscribers to upload a video on how to create coloring book illustrations. Now, I've already uploaded videos on how to draw and paint in Adobe Illustrator and on how to create original character art. I'll put a link to those videos at the end of this one. So I thought I'd try something different with this video by showing you a simple trick in Adobe Illustrator that would help you create really beautiful and intricate mandalas without needing a lot of artistic skills. And while we're on the subject of mandalas, I just want to let you know that I have a brand new mandala coloring book that's available on Amazon right now. So if you or someone you know like to color mandala artwork, or maybe you just want to pick up a copy to give yourself a little bit of inspiration for your own mandala coloring book, I'll have a link to this book in the description below. That being said, let's get started. Okay, so with Adobe Illustrator open, we'll start by creating a new document. Now the technique that I'm about to teach you will create perfectly round mandalas. For that reason, we'll make our document a perfect square. So I'm going to make sure that my units are set to inches and I'm going to set my dimensions to 8.5 by 8.5, which is the largest square book size that KDP offers. We don't need bleeds and margins for this. And I always create my books in CMYK at 300 pixels per inch. From my experience, CMYK gives you the truest color in the final print to what you would actually see on the monitor. Anytime that I've ever used RGB, the print came back way too dark. Once you have everything set up, name your document and then click create. Now this doesn't mean that you necessarily have to create a square coloring book. You can take the finished image and put it in any size book you want. We're just going to use a square document to set up the design template. The first thing we're going to do is create a few custom brushes to use. So start by opening your brush menu and delete these four bottom brushes because we won't need them. If you don't see your brush menu in the right hand column, just go up to the window tab in the top menu and select the brushes tab from the drop down. You may also want to open the swatches menu while you're here. We'll need it later on. Okay, so click on the brushes menu and then go up to the view tab in the top menu and make sure you have the smart guides enabled. If you don't have them turned on, this next part is going to go horribly wrong. The first thing we're going to do is start by creating some custom brushes. But before we start, go over to the toolbar on the left hand side and at the very top, make sure your selection tool, that's the black arrow, and the direct selection tool, that's the white arrow, are showing. They're not usually showing by default, so you may have to bring them up from the menu by clicking on the bottom right hand corner of the icon. Now that that's all set up, let's start by creating an ellipse with the ellipse tool. If you don't see the ellipse tool, it's in the same menu as the rectangle tool is. You can turn off the stroke and set the fill color to black. Again, make sure your document color mode is set to CMYK. Okay, so grab the ellipse tool and create a flattened out ellipse that looks something like this. Don't make it too thick. Give it a height of around 0.15 inches. Now with the ellipse still selected, go up to the brush menu and click on the three little lines in the top right hand corner. From the drop down menu, select new brush. From the new brush menu, choose art brush and then click OK. Now you can name the brush whatever you want, but change the width to pressure and set the brush scale options to scale proportionately. The only other thing you need to change is the colorization method and you want to set that to tints. If you don't, you won't be able to change the color of your stroke later on. Now just click OK. With your new brush selected, grab your brush tool and try it out. This is the brush that I use to do the majority of my inking when I illustrate. It has a nice thick middle and two equally tapered ends. Now let's create a second brush. So grab your ellipse tool again and create another small circle. Make sure to hold down your shift key while you're dragging it out so that it's perfectly round. 
Now, as you can see, I had the stroke on, so I'm gonna turn it off and I'm gonna make my fill color black, just like the first brush. What I want you to do now is grab your direct selection tool, that's the little white arrow, and select the anchor point on the right side of your ellipse. And holding down onto your shift key, I want you to drag that anchor point out until it lines up with the end of your first brush. Now it's not necessary to do this next step, but if you want to, you can. Click on the anchor you just dragged out and then holding down your Alt key, select the top control arm and drag it to the left and line it up with the center of your stroke. Now do the same thing with the bottom control arm. This will just give your stroke a little more of an extreme taper. But if you choose not to do it, the stroke will still look good. If you are going to do this, you may want to thin the brush out a little. Now make sure the stroke is still selected and go and repeat the same steps you did for the first brush using all of the same settings. And once again, grab your paintbrush tool and with your new brush selected, give it a try. As you can see, this brush has a nice round head and a very long tapered tail. Okay, so the final brush we're gonna create is more of a cheat than it is a brush. So select your ellipse tool one more time and make sure that the stroke is turned off and that the fill is set to black. Now I want you to create an ellipse that's about 0.24 inches all the way around. So hold down your shift key while you're creating it to make sure that it stays perfectly round. Now with it still selected, go up to the edit tab in the top menu and select copy and then go back up to the edit menu and select paste in place. Now drag the new circle over to the left so that the gap between the two circles is about 0.32 inches apart. Make sure you're holding down your shift key while you're sliding the circle over so that it stays level and lined up with the first one. Now with the new circle still selected, go up to the dimension setting in the top menu and make sure that the little lock icon is turned on and bring the height of the circle down from 0.24 to 0.22 inches. If your lock is turned on, both the height and the width will change proportionally. Now go back to that new circle and drag it back to the right until the gap between the two circles is once again 0.32 inches. When you reduce the circle size, it made the gap wider and we don't want that. Now repeat exactly what you just did with the first circle on the second circle. If you don't want to do the whole copy and paste thing, just hold down your Alt key and drag the second circle over to the left. This will automatically create a copy of the circle. This is why you want your smart guides turned on. You can see as I drag these circles apart, the smart guide lets you know that these circles are spaced evenly. Now with the third circle selected, go back to the dimensions menu and reduce the height from 0.22 inches to 0.20 inches. Once again, you're just reducing these by 0.02 every time. Again, readjust the gap so that they're still equally spaced. Now continue to create circles until your smallest circle has an overall dimension of 0.08 inches. You should end up with about nine circles total. Once you have all of the circles complete and they're all lined up and equally spaced, using your selection tool, select them all and then go up to the object tab in the top menu and choose group. Then go back up to the object tab, but this time choose expand. And with this still selected, go through the same steps you went through to create the first two brushes. After you've created the brush, select it from your brush menu, grab your brush tool, and give it a try. Now this is just a personal preference. I prefer the stroke to go from thick to thin. So I'm going to double click on the brush in the brush menu and change the direction of the brush so that it goes the opposite direction. But you don't have to do that. It's just the way that I like my brushes to work. So just to give you some more brush options, before we get started, you may want to open up some pre-made brushes that come default with Illustrator. So go up to the three lines in the brush menu and choose Open Brush Library. Then choose Artistic and then choose Artistic Color Graphic. This will give you a few more brush options to work with. Okay, so let's delete all of these strokes and let's get started setting up our mandala template.
While I'm setting up the template, I'm just gonna dock the calligraphy brushes in the top menu. Okay, so let's click back on the Layers tab and let's get started. Once again, make sure you have the Smart Guides turned on. The first thing I'm gonna do is show you how to set up a working template that will allow you to create an infinite amount of mandalas to use in your own KDP coloring books. And to do that, we're gonna start by creating a vertical line using our line tool. Make sure you're holding down your shift key so that it's perfectly straight. Also, use the align tools in the top menu to make sure it's perfectly centered horizontally and vertically. Next, with the line still selected, go up to Effect in the top menu and down to Distort and Transform and then choose Transform. In the Transform menu, set the copies to 11 and set the rotation to 15 degrees and then click OK. Now go down to the bottom of the Layers panel and click on the Create New Layer icon. Once you've created that second layer, turn off the visibility of the first layer and make sure that the second layer is selected. Now on the new layer, I want you to create a vertical and a horizontal line that are perfectly centered. Again, make sure that you have your smart guides turned on. Make each line snap right to the edge of your artboard. When creating the line, make sure to hold down your shift key to keep it perfectly straight. And also remember to center each line on the horizontal axis as well as the vertical axis using the align tools in the top menu. Once you have both lines created, turn the first layer back on. Now grab your paintbrush tool, it doesn't matter which brush you're using, and make sure that you're drawing on the new layer or your second layer. Now just draw a line that crosses over the first and second vertical lines going clockwise, like so. Next, select the entire group of layer two by clicking on the little circle on the far right hand side of the layer. And then once again, go up to effect in the top menu, down to distort and transform and choose transform. This time, we just need one copy, and we need the effect to reflect on the x-axis. Everything else can stay the same. Now click OK. With this layer group still selected, you now have to apply a second effect. So go back up to Effect in the top menu, down to Distort and Transform, and choose Transform. Then click Apply New Effect. Once again, we need to set the number of copies to 11, and set the rotation to 30 degrees, and then click OK. Now we need to make these overlapping lines disappear. To do this, select the entire group of the first layer by clicking that little circle icon on the far right hand side of the layer menu. Then go up to object in the top menu and choose expand appearance. Now deselect everything by clicking on an empty area of your artboard. Then go back to the layers panel and make sure that you're on the second layer. Now select your rectangle tool. It doesn't need a fill, just a stroke. I want you to create a rectangle that starts about one-fifth of the way from the top of your artboard, and I want you to drag it all the way over to the right until it rests on the horizontal line, just like this. With that rectangle still selected, grab your direct selection tool, that's the white arrow, and select the anchor point on the right-hand side of the rectangle, and I want you to delete it by hitting the delete key. Now go up and grab the anchor point in the top right hand corner of your rectangle and while holding down your shift key to keep the line straight, slide it to the left until it snaps directly to your second vertical line going clockwise. You should now have a closed shape that looks like this. Keep in mind that only what you draw inside of this shape will show up on your artboard. Anything drawn outside of this shape won't appear at all. You'll see what I mean later on. Once you've done that, Go up to the Layer 2 group and open the drop-down menu and make sure that the shape you just created is on top of all of the other layers. Now all you have to do is with Layer 2 highlighted, go down to the bottom layer menu and click on the little icon that's titled Make Release Clipping Mask. So you can see that if I grab my paintbrush and start drawing, the only lines that show up on my artboard are the ones that I draw between the first and second vertical lines on my grid. So that shape layer you've just created now acts as a clipping mask that hides any lines drawn outside of the first and second vertical lines. And because of the way we've set it up, it mirrors and duplicates the lines that it does show 360 degrees around your grid. So this grid we've just created is just for reference. So with your layer two menu open, make sure that all of your brushstroke layers are above the guideline layers. 
Once you've moved them and you've made sure of that, now you can lock all of your guideline layers and turn off the bottom two guides so that we can't see them. Since we no longer need these strokes, I'm just gonna delete them. I'm also going to rename these layers. I'll change layer two to line art and I'll change layer one to guides. Now go down to the guides layer, open the drop down menu and make a copy of that first group by dragging it down to the new layer icon in the bottom layer menu. Turn off the first group and select the entire second group by clicking on the little circle on the far right hand side. Now because these lines are purely for reference, we want to set them up in a way that we can visually tell them apart. So with the top group selected, I'm going to keep the strokes black for this group, but I'm going to bring the stroke weight down to 0.25. These guidelines are going to be very thin, so we shouldn't be confusing our drawn lines with the reference guides. Now I'm going to hide the top group and I'm going to turn on the bottom group and I'll select the bottom group so that I can now adjust it. So with the group selected, I'm going to start by changing the line colors to a light gray. And once again, I'm going to set the stroke weight to 0.25. You can use any color you want, it really doesn't matter. Now with the bottom group still selected, I'm going to go up to the edit tab in the top menu and down to distort and transform and once again choose transform. In the rotation menu, I'm going to rotate these lines by 7.5 degrees. And now I'll turn the top group back on. So remember, when you draw, you're going to be drawing between the first two vertical black lines. The light gray lines are just there for a little more reference. Trust me, they'll come in handy when you're drawing small circles and you're trying to center them between these two black lines. Now before we lock out the first layer, let's add a few circular reference lines as well. So grab your ellipse tool and make sure that only the stroke has color on it and keep the stroke width at 0.25. You can just keep the stroke color the same as the last lines you created. Now create three reference circles that are slightly larger than the previous one. Make sure to hold down your shift key when you're creating them so that they're perfect circles. Create the smallest one first and then make sure to use the align tools to center the circles both vertically and horizontally. Once you've got all the circles in place, lock the guides layer. You now have a template for creating mandalas. So you can create as many as you want. Be sure to save this file somewhere where you can easily find it. Now that we have our template created, make sure that you're on your line art layer, grab one of the brushes you just created and start experimenting. So before we get started, the first thing that I'm gonna do is open up all of the brushes I'm gonna use. So in addition to the brushes that I've created, I'm also going to open up that set of calligraphy brushes as well, just in case. Now keep in mind that no one brush stroke is fixed. You can change the look of any brush stroke after you've drawn it. So if you're not getting the look that you want from a particular brush, then play around with the brush definition settings in the top menu to try and find what it is you're looking for. Also keep in mind that you're not just limited to using brushes. You can use your shape tools to draw with as well. You're only limited by your own imagination. So play around with all of the tools that Illustrator has to offer to really get a unique looking mandala. Just to keep this video from going over an hour, I'm gonna speed up the footage here and just talk over it. I'll keep it slow enough though that you'll still be able to see what I'm doing. Most of what this technique involves is drawing a stroke and then playing around with the line weight until you get the desired look. This process is a lot of drawing and then deleting and then redrawing until you find what you're looking for. So be patient. Now as you're creating your design, remember to zoom in and out from time to time. When you're zoomed in, all of your artwork may look very spacious. But when you zoom out to the actual print size, which is about here, you don't want all of your geometry to be really, really tiny. So make sure you're watching that. 
Now, if you're creating lace patterns that are only going to be used as art prints or as t-shirt designs, just drawing a bunch of little strokes like this is fine. But if you're creating a mandala for a coloring book page, you need to make sure to compartmentalize everything you're doing. In other words, you need to make sure that there are a lot of individual spaces to color in. Otherwise, it'll be a horrible coloring book page. Here's an example. If I'm just creating an art print, leaving this area wide open is fine. But if it's going to be a coloring page, I need to create a bunch of individual spaces to color. So I need to turn this shape into multiple individual spaces by separating them. See what I'm saying? It's also important not to leave all of your line weights the same thickness. Try to have about three or four different stroke weights throughout the entire piece. Remember, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Art is subjective. It's all about what you think looks good. I found that filling in some of the empty spaces with pure black will give the piece a little bit more of a finished look in the end. Try not to go overboard with it though. Again, as you can see, I just keep creating a lot of individual spaces. The more there is to color, the better coloring book page this will be. When it comes to shapes, you may want to limit the number of different shapes to no more than three or four in any one piece. What I mean by shapes is how you peak the top of your loops. Having a mandala with 20 different peak styles can become a little overwhelming visually.
If you find something that doesn't look right long after you've drawn it, don't be afraid to change it. Sometimes you can't tell if something is gonna work until you see it surrounded by other shapes and strokes. You'll notice that sometimes I keep redoing the same strokes over and over. And that's because I'm not sure what I want to do next. So I played with some different designs. When I finally figure out what I want to do, many times what I had just previously drawn won't work with what I want to do. So I have to delete it and do it again so that it fits properly. And this is a good example of that. If I had kept the center point of this loop peeking outwards, the ellipse wouldn't have fit properly. So I had to make the stroke join in a valley so that the circle would sit down in it nicely. Once you've got your drawing all laid out, this is the time to go through and take a look at your overall piece from a distance. The drawing may look thin or maybe a little bit disproportionate. So go through and thicken up some of the line weights to give the image a fuller look. Again, I don't recommend filling in too much with black, but the odd accent here and there can really finish off a piece nicely. So here's a quick look at the finished piece.
Okay, so hopefully this video will help you create some amazing mandalas for your own KDP coloring book. Now, if you've never used Adobe Illustrator before and you'd like to give it a try, I have an affiliate link to the software in the description below. If you like these type of tutorial videos and you want to see more of them, then be sure to give this video a thumbs up to let me know. If you want to check out a few more of my drawing and design videos, you can find a link to them right here. Until next time, take care.